This report from 1991 gained unprecedented access to the elite FBI unit, which spends all of its time studying and stalking people who kill for the thrill of it. We have a body. They've discovered a body here. The bodies of the dead women were all dumped in open areas. Serial murder is the scare crime of the 90s. These murderers are intelligent, with IQs often over 125. They don't stop killing until they're caught. And their victims never know they are the chosen prey until it is too late. Like the 67 young men authorities say were lured into mild-mannered Randy Kraft's car with offers of beer and drugs. Meet G-Man John Douglas, whose elite 12-person unit examines over a 1,000 cases of violent crime every year, the FBI's behavioral science unit, the crack team fictionalized in the movie Silence of the Lambs. It's like they read the same book on how to abduct women or children and how to torture uh, women and children or men. Here they allowed us a rare glimpse of an actual case. The FBI and local police for the first time agreed to open their files on a serial murder investigation in Wilmington, Delaware. Thanksgiving weekend, 1987. State Trooper Joe Swiskey is called to a murder scene, the first victim of the man who would come to be known as the Corridor Killer. Ultimately, five women would disappear along an eight-mile stretch of US-40, frequented by hitchhikers and prostitutes. We saw the obvious signs of torture, uh, the hands being bound, and then we saw the duct tape, and we knew that uh, whatever or whoever had done this, it was something we weren't used to dealing with. June 29, 1988. County police find a dead woman near Wilmington. To Detective Jim Hedrick, it immediately rings a bell. Like the woman six months earlier, Catherine DeMauro had been bound and tortured. A natural fear was is that uh, we potentially had a serial killer at that point. The day after DeMauro's death, state and county forces took what evidence they had to the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia. And here in this room, Special Agents Steve Mardigian and Jim Zopp sat with Delaware authorities, looking for what they called the signature, clues which characterized this killer and this killer alone. You can notice on, the, uh, on her right wrist, there's evidence of, uh, of bruising around the wrist there. You can notice around her neck, there's evidence of, uh, of uh, uh, some type of device constricted around her neck. She was tortured. Yeah, yeah, yeah. she was tortured. What's missing from the scene are the devices that caused the, the injuries that you're looking at. Then they noted another small detail that would prove critical as Delaware authorities continued their hunt for the corridor killer. As the earlier victim, one of the significant forensic findings at the scene was uh, a multitude of blue fibers covering the body. Those blue fibers, painstakingly analyzed in the FBI labs, were identical on both of the dead women. The location in which the bodies were found also uh, all together suggested the possibility that this person had some involvement in the construction trade. That first week of July, the FBI drew a picture of the crimes for Delaware authorities. First two clues, blue fibers on both victims indicated they'd been killed in the same place. Torture was the killer's signature. And he would be a construction worker, a he-man type. He would drive a four-wheel vehicle or van. And based on extensive knowledge of serial crimes, the FBI also told local police... This individual uh, would be a white male, that uh, he would be between the ages of 25 to 35, that he would live in the area of where these bodies were being found, uh, because that would be what they classified as his comfort zone. By September of 88, there were two victims and three more women were missing. The task force knew that it was a race against the clock, with the FBI telling them the killer would strike again and he would likely change his strategy. He did. The next body was dumped here in the Chesapeake and Delaware Canal, naked, with all physical evidence washed away. It was September 21st, and there were still 12 suspects. But that same day, the cops would get the break that would give them their prime suspect, and it was the result of good police work by an eager young rookie. This is Officer Renee Lano, and this is Officer Renee Lano, in the disguise she chose for her part in tracking the corridor killer. She began walking the shadowy stretch of highway where the victims had last been seen, wearing a hooker's getup and a hidden microphone. Dozens of men stopped her, and some became suspects. She'd been at it 10 hours a night since July, 
when finally in September, there was a man in a blue van who was not like any of the others. So I opened the passenger door. Um, we talked. I basically played the uh, dumb stoned routine, like I had been smoking drugs all day, and I was pretty wasted. This is the conversation her hidden mic recorded. And then through the conversation, you know, I found out he was in the construction trade, the blue van, I saw the blue carpet, and I took into account all these things that I'm looking at and I'm thinking, uh, you know, I think this guy's involved. Lano's next challenge was to get a sample of that blue carpet without getting trapped in the van. And I pretty much just started acting like, you know, that the van and the, the carpet, and it was like a real, it was a sexual turn on for me. You know, I was stroking it, rubbing it, and as I was doing that, I was plucking fibers. Now, with the fibers in hand, she made an excuse and got away from the van. At the lab, the blue fibers were a match for the ones found on Shirley Ellis and Catherine DeMauro. And the man in the blue van also bore an uncanny resemblance to the profile the FBI had drawn. Stephen Pinnell, 31 years old, an electrician who worked construction jobs. As predicted, he was married. He lived in this trailer park within the so-called comfort zone where he killed. November 29, 1988. Stephen Pinnell is arrested as the corridor killer. One year to the day the first victim was found. Armed with search warrants, authorities found more incriminating evidence. In the van, the blue carpet, stained with Catherine DeMauro's blood. They also found pliers consistent with the victim's wounds, bindings of wire and duct tape and a sex film with torture as its theme. Stephen Pinnell maintains his innocence. He believes the FBI was out to get him and calls it two and a half years of injustice. He declined repeated requests for an interview. No doubt about it that he is, he is responsible for the crime. We got the right guy here and this, that this was one thorough investigation. The difficult case of Stephen Pinnell was a triumph for the FBI and local authorities who worked to bring him to jail. Pinnell was found guilty in the cases where blue carpet samples were found. He was recharged with the third murder and indicted on a fourth. Although he continued to maintain his innocence, he asked that his sentence be carried out to spare his family further anguish. That the enormity of these two crimes, their cold premeditation and their callous execution clearly outweigh any mitigating factors. And so, on March 14, 1992, Serial killer Stephen Pinnell became the first person executed in Delaware in 46 years.